prepared this a PowerPoint presentation. It's already up on the website along with a uh, handout. The handout is actually on the website. It's not going to be handed out tonight because it's got uh, clickable links within the handout so you can go to the sources of information directly. We feel it's real important that we put a disclaimer up there uh, because you know, while we want you taking us at our work, not too much so, uh, we want to give ourselves a little bit of wiggle room. So, um, tonight's presentation, like Blade says, on shelter, clothing, and water. It's an overview of these things. It's not a detailed, comprehensive view of any of them. There's just not enough time for that. So, we figure maybe we'll spend roughly 20 minutes per topic. Survival. Survival experts, and most of you have heard of the rule of threes, but here they are. Three minutes without air. That's pretty extreme. I don't think I can do that long, but I suppose some people can and still live. Three hours without shelter in a harsh environment. Three days without water in a harsh environment and three weeks without food. What you do need to know about that, however, is that in each of these cases, if you go that long without them, you're, you're borderlining, you're pushing it, and uh, especially with, like with the food, for example, you'll become lethargic, and it'll be difficult to go foraging for food at all uh, by that point in time. So. So, concentrate on the most important problem first. If you focus on those things, then you keep your mind clear, and you know what you need to do next once you have accomplished each of these items. Okay, there's different types of shelters. In-home, public shelters, like community center or whatever. Uh, we saw it in Hurricane Katrina. Uh, how the public were put in places uh, just to survive. wasn't a real good situation, but it was better than drowning or death there. Camping, trailers, and tents. And in the wilderness, makeshift shelters. Well, kind of hit each of those, except for the public. In home. Okay, CERT. Oh, that should be capitalized, CERT, all the way through. It's an acronym. Uh, SIR stands for Community Emergency Response Team. They are sponsored by FEMA and have put together a very comprehensive program with different levels uh, of certification. But we have taken, done this here in Millville now, the city sponsoring it. Uh, and several of us in this room went through that course and became certified to respond in the case of some kind of incident or emergency uh, that required community help where outside services could not get to us fast enough. Earthquake, uh, a massive earthquake might bring down dorm rooms at the college and uh, other places like that, apartment buildings. Well, the emergency response teams, there's not that much of them here in the valley and so they're going to go where they can do the most good the fastest. CERT teams are in several communities, but not all communities in the valley yet. And one of the things they taught us was that when we go to step in in these situations, our purpose is to respond and help people and do what we can, doing the most good the quickest. In some situations, people will die, and that's just a fact of life. We've seen it all over the world. So, oh, before I bring that up, one of the things CERT suggested was that we need to each have a kit in our home. And if you go to some of these websites, you can see what the kit's composed of. Uh, but the kit is designed to allow you an emergency such as um, a, a uh, 
plume of some kind, a chemical plume or something like that, passing over the region, you can go in your bathroom, seal it off for a given period of time. Uh, there's obviously going to be limits because you're going to want to seal it completely. And so you want to have yourself set up so that you can do your best. Generally, when that kind of a situation occurs, uh, and you will be notified, get you know to your in-home sheltering, and that's what that's called, then you need to be prepared to go in there right then and stay there until they come around and tell you it's safe to come out. And then get out of the house and air it out completely because the rest of your house will probably be somewhat contaminated on the interior while outside it will have blown away. I had uh, I wondered about that when they taught us that, but then when they explained that further, then it made sense. Uh, I've got these three, don't, don't even bother trying to write them down, but you can memorize them if you want. Probably not too many of you will. It's on the handout uh, that's on the website. Okay, next one is camping. Trailer. Whoops. Uh, yeah, a well stocked trailer can give you survivability for a long period of time. But you need to consider what you really need in a trailer. It's not for, this is not for just going out and having fun in the wilderness, you know, on a relaxing weekend. So you need food, at least a month's supply for each person. And, I mean, the object is survival. And that's the point of this. Uh, you need eating and cooking utensils, matches, fire starters, water, water filtering, blankets, <coughs> sleeping bags, clothing, heating, including the fuel, sanitation and hygiene, sewing kit. I mean, imagine if you're out there and you don't have accommodations of any kind for sanitation and hygiene, how quickly things go downhill and people die in those situations. Solar power for lighting and electricity if you need it, and you probably will. There are solar panels available. Um, there's different qualities of solar panels when you look around don't assume that just anything you can go pick up is the best way to go, because it very well may not be. Uh, look at how long the warranty is on those solar panels. And generally, if they're not very long, they're generally not very good. So that needs to be considered. There's some solar panels available that are like 25-year warranty on. Radios, flashlights, walkie-talkies, you want to be able to listen and find out what's going on. <coughs> First aid kit, obviously. Weapons. Um, I'm going to tell you, one time, uh, Glade and I were out camping with our dad uh, and our other brother, and uh, we were sitting around a campfire at night up down in Arizona, and as we were sitting there, we started noticing and hearing little sounds off just outside the perimeter of the fire a little ways. We started watching, and we could see two eyes just kind of going around watching us. And we figured that, well, he probably, whatever it is, is not going to come in with the fire burning. And maybe he just didn't think we'd taste that good either. But uh, we don't really know what it was. We didn't really want to find out either, so, but it's good to be prepared <coughs> to protect yourself. Tools. Uh, you need all those types of items. And again, I would like to reiterate that this presentation, so you can go back and review it, is already up on that website under Classes, so you can watch it online. Reading material and games. If you're going to be out there for very long, you need some kind of diversion to make your life have some quality. It's very important to keep a good attitude. You should keep notes, a log, a daily log of what's going on. Uh, it might surprise you what you will learn from doing that and what you might help other people with. 
you, you just don't know. Worst case scenario, you can always destroy it, but, you know, it could be useful. Lawn chairs. Tarps. Okay, camping in a tent. Consideration should be given to the size of the tent, the strength, by strength I mean both structurally and the quality of the cloth. Uh, there's quite a varying degree in each case of those. Uh, some material. Supplies, and this is again if you have to spend a long time out surviving. Sanitation, which will be discussed in a later class, and hygiene. First aid supplies, you should have with you all the time. Some entertainment material. <coughs> you need some kind of protection, again, of weapons of some kind. And knives are very important in this kind of a situation especially. And each item will depend, of course, on the number of people that you're sheltering. Now, this is this kind of shelter you may not be quite as familiar with. That's not a pup tent. <coughs> it kind of looks like one, but it's not. It's a poncho. And it's one of the things that the military does use, especially in emergency situations. Now, I can tell you from experience, uh, you can make a tent, you can make a sleeping bag with a poncho. Years ago in Arizona, uh, we went up with our ward group to the bishop's cabin in the winter. And I'd been going through, we had a guy in our ward that was a retired Green Beret captain. And I'd been going through some training with him, and he had told us, you know, or taught us about how to do these things, how to set them up, how to use them. And so I decided we're not going to sleep in the cabin with everybody else. So I had my oldest boy and I slept out in this kind of a tent with a, pon a poncho and two ponchos with two liners. We slept on the snow up in what's called the Rim Country in Arizona. Uh, very cold. We were perfectly comfortable. We stayed warm. So this is a kind of an inexpensive way, if you have to survive, uh, to do it. And you can do very well. Now, of course, it's not a living quarters kind of situation, but it's a survival situation. And uh, here's some uh, references. There's uh, four references there. This last one is the military field manual. And I'm giving you there the exact pages to look at. They show you all the variations of setting up these kind of tents, uh, the poncho tents. Um, so they're very good. And the others have pictures of different ones that are doing it or have done it. OK, moving on to clothing, cold weather. Layering, as you all know, we've lived here in Millville and Cache Valley probably long enough to know layering is very important to keep warm. But what a lot of people don't know <coughs> is what type of material is the most effective material for your layering. Okay? And so you want a what's called a wicking layer. And what that means is, even in the cold, your body will sweat. But you want to get that sweat off of you, otherwise it freezes and you get cold. And so, polypropylene material is the best solution. These are not like normal thermals. This is a polypropylene thermal. Okay? And the material in this is extremely effective in keeping you warm. <coughs> um, the gloves that are showing there are actually these things. These are also polypropylene material. 
And what you do, simple enough obviously, is you use them as glove liners. And it keeps your hands very warm. Can I guarantee that? Well, it'll keep them a lot warmer than if I stick them in even in this lined glove. They're not going to stay warm like they will if you're using these liners. They have socks as well and polypropylene types of uh, head, head gear to use. Uh, the head gear should also be insulating. I picked this particular type. This is a military helmet liner, as they call it. Very, very effective in keeping your head warm. Uh, I've got one and I've used it. And you almost, it gets, you get so warm you almost can't take it. You know, it, it's that comforting. Uh, we went to a, Brent, I say we, Brent Unjum and I went to a uh, presentation out in Wellsville about a year ago where a brother, a guy from uh, Smith Edwards spoke and he, he took like, uh, what, two hours? Two hours just telling us about clothing. That's, that's how much there is to know about it. Obviously, we don't have that kind of time. But one of the things he related was that when uh, he was aware of some guys that went out camping or snowmobiling, wasn't it? And their snowmobiles got stuck way, way, way back in the forest. And the one guy had on, like, what, two, three hundred dollar thermal boots? Thermal boots. Yeah, really expensive ones. <coughs> the other guy had these Mickey Mouse, as they call them, boots. And on the way out, the guy with the real expensive boots, they had to go through a creek that was still running ice water. And uh, the guy in the, in the expensive boots came to a point where he couldn't keep going. His feet were too frozen. And his friend, in these cheaper, and they're what, 40, 80, 80, bucks. 80 bucks, okay, roughly, uh, <coughs> boots, his feet were calm, or warm even though they'd gotten wet inside of these boots. They stayed warm. And he was able to haul the other guy out and save both of them's lives. So this is a good item to have. Uh, especially if you're going to go in the back country or be in those kinds of situations. What about, I've got some old bunny boots. Do they work? Some what? Old bunny boots that the military put out? I'm not familiar with those. So no. I don't think they white ones with the felt layer. Oh, well, they're rubberized. Is it yeah. like that? They're white? Yeah. They're the exact same. Okay. Yeah. They, they come in both black and the white kind of things. And, and you know, maybe if you push it enough, the, women could find a pink one. <laughs> <laughs> rubber paint. Right. There you go, rubber paint. Okay. Uh, now, warm weather. We lived in Arizona uh, for a long time, and I went out hunting and camping a lot in Arizona. And so I had a lot of experience with this kind of thing. And the first thing I learned about with this Green Beret guy was to go down to the Army Surplus store and buy these polypropylene socks. They're white. Okay? And, uh, of course, here I would have gotten black because I didn't see any white ones down there, but maybe they had them at Smith Edwards. But, you put those on and it wicks the moisture out of you. Also put another sock on, even though you're in that kind of heat. It wicks the moisture off your feet and if you're hiking very much, it keeps you from getting blisters. <coughs> the where blisters come from is when your feet get moist, heat builds up, and then you get blisters. I learned that the hard way. Uh, we were out on the desert one time with this uh, Green Beret guy, and we'd been out all day in the desert sun, and by the time we got into our tents in the evening, my feet were blistered. 
and he was also the team medic as well as the team captain, so I called him over. He had his young son with him, and this is how I learned the hard way. I called him over and I says, my feet are blistered, I don't know what I'm going to do, I can't hardly walk on them. And he turned around to his son and says, come here son. The son came over, and I, I knew them quite well, I knew the family well, the son well. And he says, son, see this man? Don't be a whiner like him when you grow up. <laughs> I learned to pick my questions carefully after that. <laughs> and uh, learn as I went. A boonie hat. Uh, I think they really became popular, I'm, I'm thinking, in Vietnam. Uh, I don't know that they were used a whole lot before that. Maybe some of you old people in the back know. <laughs> well, they were there. They were they there, were I know there. that. Okay. That's the boonie hat right there. The other thing there is a mosquito netting that you can put over them. And it protects you. I have sat in Arizona by large ponds hunting, and the mosquitoes, it was a stagnant pond, the mosquitoes were just as thick as could be. Never got one mosquito bite. That mat netting really works well. Okay. It's interesting. <clears throat> To me, and one of the things that struck me, especially in Arizona, and again we're talking about warm weather, was that the Mexicans who worked doing yard work in Arizona all wore flannel, long sleeve shirts. And I thought, are you guys crazy? And they also wore a lot of heavy headgear. So I finally found out that the reason is because as they're sweating, they sweat into the material and it works like refrigeration. As they move around, the sweat evaporates and it cools. So that's why they do it. Plus, of course, you don't want to get things biting you and scratching you, etc. And I, and I always... I think it's funny when I see pictures of people out hiking and the woman is always in shorts. I'm thinking, <clears throat> are you aware that there are critters out there anywhere? Uh, they can get you. Not only that, if you're having to cross over rough terrain, you scratch way easier. And scratches cause infections. Protective gloves, of course, uh, and the socks. Now, by the way, in case you don't know it, but <clears throat> one of the things you should have in your first aid kit, I'm getting into somebody else's area here, but to go along with the socks and that, if you get blisters, uh, there's a material, all of a sudden my mind went blank, um, Moleskin. Moleskin. <clears throat> Moleskin, thank you. Moleskin, you can cut it up any shape, size, whatever. It'll just stick right to you and it protects you while you're walking so that the blisters don't get worse. Yeah. I think there's a better one now. Okay. But I don't know what I'm just telling you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we, we uh, what I'll do is I'll way. go home and Google what that said. That was no, a, just, Google <coughs> just Google blisters and okay. I think it'll come up with it. Good. One thing that works well too is duct tape, if you don't have any of that fancy stuff. Okay. I had never tried that one. <laughs> I had a partner in Arizona that the seat of his truck got all worn out, so he duct taped the whole seat. That doesn't work well in Arizona heat. <laughs> I gotta tell you, it was funny. Okay, water. And we're, we're gonna get out of here early. <clears throat> when I was in Arizona, I was an assistant scoutmaster, and we took a trip up into the, well, a couple of different trips up in the Superstition Mountains, but one of them we hiked up the south side and went up into... Rebus uh, Ranch. 
No, that, no. this time wasn't Reba's no. Ranch. Um, this was a different location. And it was fine when we went up in the evening, but when we got ready to leave, we did rappelling on cliffs and stuff like that. And had a lot of fun. Got ready to leave and discovered some of the boys did not bring enough water. <clears throat> the result was, in that whole big group, there were several boys and leaders that came this close to death. And uh, what we had to do, two of us had been through the Green Beret training and had learned a lot about how to mentally control yourself in, in hard situations. And so what we eventually ended up doing was leaving most of them up there in any type of, uh, sh uh, not sheltered, but uh, shut, what's the word I'm thinking of, shaded, <laughs> shaded places that they could find under rocks or whatever. And two, three of us went out. One of them was my oldest boy, and he left before we did, but uh, the scoutmaster and I left them there with another couple of adults. And we left them and gave them all of our water when we left. We had a long ways to go to get out of that uh, location, and it was probably 110 degrees. It was bad. And part way down, one of the things that happens when you're short on water is your mind starts playing tricks on you and you cannot think rationally. The scoutmaster mind started going wacko on him. And all of a sudden he's telling me, we need to go down this way and it's like this. <laughs> no, the trail goes here. If we go that way, we die. And I had to force him, even though he's much larger than me, to go down the trail. But by the time we went halfway between that point and where the vehicles were, we were in such bad condition that every step I took, my legs were just shaking like that. I couldn't control it. And so we got back to the vehicle anyway, forced ourselves, got watered up. We had plenty of water there, luckily, and then but I was in too bad a shape to go back up, and so was the scoutmaster for quite a while. My son had been down already and gotten rehydrated, and he went back up and took water, and they all got out. Water is critical to survival. And this occurred over a period of just a couple of hours. This wasn't a long period of time. So. Uh, in the last week or so, we've seen what's happened back east in, what, West Virginia? With uh, the chemical spills into the water supply, 300,000 people without drinkable water or even usable water of any kind. You have to ask the question, are you prepared to survive in those situations where you'll be out from water? Could it happen here? Bet it could. And how about where your families live? Part of the purpose of this is for us to help each other and encourage each other to be prepared, but also to teach our children and our grandchildren so that they're prepared wherever they live. We want them to survive too. So <clears throat> let's look at water storage and water access. Here's a common method of water storage, very effective, it stores a lot of water, but it has to be, it, we had a guy in the CERT class that's a water uh, expert from here in the valley, and he showed us and taught us how if you fill these drums properly, you can trust that water for 25 years which just blew my mind. I didn't think you could do that with water. 
but if treated correctly and everything, you can leave it there for 25 years and still perfectly good to drink. Okay, there's lots of containers. They got to be cleaned. He and I disagreed a little bit over the medium of containers to use, but that's okay. Um, I prefer juice bottles in the most cases because they're square or rectangular and they store better. Round ones work, but they take up more space than you know, the pop bottles. Either works. He preferred the pop bottles. I prefer the juice bottles. The reason uh, when I asked him after the class why the pop bottles instead of the juice bottles, sometimes, you know, I, I don't want to sound like I'm criticizing, but, you know, his response was, well, the juice bottles uh, can still have ju or sugar left over in them. I said, well, pop has sugar in it too. <laughs> and the bottles are made of the same stuff. So if you wash them both out, you need to get them clean so there's no sugar left in them because the sugar will breed bacteria. Okay? Gallon jugs, but never milk jugs. Never. Why? Because the milk jugs you cannot get, no matter how much you wash them and clean them, you cannot get all of the milk out, and they will breed bacteria. Now, if you buy in distilled water, well, you can use that, you know, because they're made for that. <coughs> Whoops. All right. Access and filtering. Of course, there's, and I, and I have a lot of examples here. Uh, these are water straws, which is what this first one is here, where you can just literally dip one end in the water and suck the water out and drink it. Okay? Uh, there's this style. There's a lot of styles. Um, here's another one. Uh, this is one that was made a long time ago down in Arizona. And I won't go into all the details on that, but it's a very effective water filter. Uh, it's bacteria static because it uses a sil ionized silver bonded to the carbon element as well as you know, micron type of filtration. But the ionized silver, silver is one of the most effective uh, killing agents that there is for bacteria. You ever wondered how the pioneers came across the plains with the water that they got stored in big wooden barrels? You've got to imagine there had to be a certain amount of brackishness to that water. How did they drink it and have it not kill them? There's a simple reason. You throw a silver dollar in it. The silver attracts the molecules, it attracts the bacteria, and kills it on contact. And that was one of the things that we learned uh, about these types of water filters, how effective they are. Uh, there's a lot of different types of things out there, but silver is in incredibly bacterial static. And so that's one of the things you should know and look for and always have on hand is something like that. Colloidal silver works wonders in killing bacteria. Think about burn units in hospitals. What do they use to treat burn patients? They use them in a silver colloidal solution uh, tub or whatever depending on what's burned on their body to keep the bacteria from attacking them and killing them. That's what they use. So, <clears throat> that's a very effective method. Now, another thing I learned about when I was with the Green Bray guy is how to make your own still. This works in the desert. It works anywhere, as long as you've got some sun. Okay? And what you do is you dig a hole down the ground, you put a container in the bottom, you have clear plastic, put a rock in the center of it, you seal it around, <coughs> but you also have put some kind of foliage down in here. The sun going through that plastic 
will cause condensation. The rock allows that con condensation to come down to the point right over your container, drip in the container. And you have a little straw or drinking tube coming up out of it. Now, are you going to get a lot of water from that? No, but some is better than none. So this is the solution that's used. Uh, this is one of the things that the Green Beret uh, learned about right away. And I look in the field manual. This is the main method for getting water when you're out there and there's no other way to get water. Any questions on that? <laughs> Does it have to be cleaned, or is that water okay? Yeah, it's just this is almost like distilling water because all you what you're doing with distilling heats it up and it vaporizes, and when it vaporizes, it drops out all the bacteria, it drops out all of the harmful chemicals, and then distilling condenses. Well, that's exactly what's happening here. It's drawing the moisture out of these leaves and, and foliage that you've got down here, it's drying them out and condensing that moisture up on the bottom of uh, this plastic sheet. It's a fairly good idea to have the plastic sheet clean. Uh, Especially on the bottom side. Yeah, the bottom side, yeah. But uh, you can also put the yellow water in there or any bad water because it'll be You're absolutely clean. right. If you've got nothing else, and like no foliage to put in this hole, mm -hmm. you can urinate in the hole. Yeah. Because when you do this, it'll draw it up. And only the good stuff, drinkable stuff, will condense and come on the bottom of that screen. So it works. Good point. Thanks, Brent. Okay. Filtering. I've already showed you some filters. There are a lot of brands, including ceramic and whatnot, uh, carbon micron technology. Aquamira is a very prominent water filter company in the industry. And it just so happens they're here in Cache Valley. It's one of their main offices for development and all that kind of stuff. And in addition to this stuff here, <coughs> They have been working on and developed a water filter that should be out sometime within the next month or two. They were, when we went through the CERT class, they had promised us we'd have it by December, but that didn't happen. So we're hoping in the next couple of months. It is so effective, it removes 99.99999% of all bacteria and harmful chemicals. It's that effective. And these guys are the ones when uh, the last big uh, a storm happened over in the Mideast, or not Mideast, in the Orient there, uh, monsoon. They supplied massive types of water filtration systems that you can literally collapse right down to almost nothing that would supply whole villages. Three of these units, which would fold out in about this much room, would supply the water that Melville citizens need. And they are extremely effective. Uh, I asked him about filtration systems for people on the islands with water, salt water, that's all I had. And he said they had been working hard and developing stuff for that as well. So. Anyway, we're hoping that will come out soon. Uh, the guy that's over at development that was the one that taught in the CERT class, and one of the things that he said, he, he's been in taught water treatment and stuff all over the world. And <clears throat> he has uh, taught in colleges, he's taught in, in uh, countries, you know, for the governments, and etc. He said, and he's retired two or three times from doing this. <laughs> But Aquamira talked him into coming back to work for him. This filter that they're coming out with, and I'm not pushing it because I don't represent Aquamira. Uh, 
But he says this filter that they are have developed now and are working on getting ready for uh, production to the public is what he has waited for his entire life in terms of a water filtration system, a portable one. So, one other thing I wanted to add here's the water treatment. Um, these things here. If you have water in those big 60 gallon drums and you question whether or not it's still good to use and you don't have another source of water so you need to use it, this stuff here will take care of any problems you got as far as bacteria or anything like that. Is silver in that or what's actually in that? Uh, I'm just curious. It's a chlorine dioxide, is what it says, um, and a phosphoric acid, and you mix them together, and that's how they become so effective. Yeah. Okay. You mix them together. And once you've mixed them, that's it. You know, you have to use it right then. So, and of course, the last one is distillation which removes all bacteria and all harmful elements. The only problem that I know of with distillation, unless they've improved it, changed what they're, how they do it, and I can't imagine that they have, uh, is that distillation removes all of the trace minerals and stuff from water that does two things. It's a nutrient for your body that you get in regular drinking water. And two, it makes it very tasteless. It's just pure bland water that, you know, and you wonder if you're getting anything good out of it. So, but this is extremely effective, and if you have a way of putting the trace minerals back in, it's probably the most effective thing that there is available. These are house units. This is a, like a countertop type unit. Uh, and you can get them, some of them are reasonable. Um, I saw prices online for some of the house, excuse me, old house units for like $1,300. Um, I'm probably not inclined to go that route, as most people aren't. But these other units, I mean, you can get them, I think, for around $100. So. Any questions on that? Do you need those units put to... Uh when you distill water, you lose all the air in it too, and it makes it taste weird. It, it, it does anything that reoxygenates or re aerates the water? I don't think they do. Uh, they might a little bit, but I mean, and, and I'm glad you brought up that point because oxygenating water also helps kill bacteria. One of the ways to get a little air in your water is just to pour it back into yeah. two containers. Right. Is that what you're going to say? Okay. What about bleach? Is that like you bleach? don't do that oh, anymore? Or? I can't believe I forgot that. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> that was one of the things I certainly meant to have on here. Okay. Um, there is a standard, uh, and I meant to copy it out of my CERT manual and put it in here, and I, I will tell you what, I will redo that and add it to this PowerPoint. Uh, but there is a standard of how many drops use for like a quart of water, for a gallon of water, or whatever, um, and then when you get, that will kill the bacteria. Now you have to understand there are two different elements or aspects to this. One is bacteria, the other is harmful chemicals. Two different things when you're talking about drinking water. The chlorine will kill a bacteria, but it's not going to do anything if there's harmful chemicals in the water. So. You want to have good, clean water, but if you want to make sure it's bacteria-free, then you use the bleach. When you get ready to use the water, then you want to take it out and let it stand in the sun for maybe five to ten minutes to let any residue bleach that's in it leave, yes, and then you can drink it safely. Your bleach also gets old, so you've got to keep up-to-date bleach. You're going to have to talk a little Your louder. bleach gets old. You cannot use old bleach. That's correct. And never use um, scented bleach. Yeah. Always use, 
you don't want to push a specific brand, but Clorox is probably the safest that there is to use. So, but yeah, bleach gets old. And if possible, you always want to filter out the chlorine because just as it'll kill the bacteria in the water, it'll kill the bacteria in your intestinal flora that's 70% of your immune system. And in bad situations, you want your immune system as high as possible. All right. All right. Well, you on this fight. Can you go back and say how you how do you make water survive 25 years in those barrels? Oh, you'd almost have to have this guy do it <laughs> because he had a very complex system using a very specific type of hoses and connectors and all that kind of stuff, uh, and you know, it's using good water to fill them and making sure that the containers themselves are clean also internally. Um, yeah, they were just sterile. Everything that he did was sterile, and so yeah. if you don't introduce bacteria, it can't grow. Exactly. So, maybe I can talk him into giving me some kind of a presentation that I can put up on the website. Uh, did he use just city water? I, I believe he did. He did. did. He, say that? he, he yeah. rinsed out the barrel really well in the Clorox. Though. Clorox. Mm -hmm. And then cleaned that out, and then all of his tubing was surgical tubing, right. so nothing, nothing had bacteria. Like your regular hoses outside, you would never use oh, those. Oh yeah, never. Right. But he just. If, if you're going to use your hose outside to fill your blue barrel, you'll definitely want to use something bacteria static to filter it before you drink it. So then, uh, if you have your hose then what, you get the surgical? Yeah, he, yeah. he shoved the surgical to tubing that you connected. And, 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 and he has, a, has an adapter to hook onto your, yeah, you have to have an adapter so then, and then the tube and then put yeah. it into your barrels. Right. And so that's a one-time use then? On the tubing? Tu on your tubing and everything is a one-time use. No, he, I mean, he, he had it set up such that you could use it over and over as long as uh, you kept it clean every time. Slide the gas with it later. <laughs> <laughs> that always kills the bacteria. <laughs> These are the hoses that you can hook up to your RV stuff that's meant for yes. keeping the water clean. Would that be effective in this? Yes. I yeah. suppose it he would. Did, he I mean, had those did there. he mention uh -huh. that? Uh -huh. I can't remember. Okay. So, yeah. And maybe, I mean, this is a good conversation. Maybe in the future, like in phase two, we can. Talk to him and see if he'll come and actually do a presentation. Yeah, I've already talked to him, and he would have been willing to come tonight, but I wasn't willing to let him. I was going to say, he's really long. <laughs> we wouldn't have had exactly. time. But, but, but the meeting would have been <clears throat> an hour long yeah. or so just just for that. So we can so. consider that in the future. Yeah. So, so. Any other questions on the water? Yeah. No, just not, not on other than water. Oh. I'll wait Oh, I, I, I think that was where I finished distillation. <coughs> well, you timed it just right. Um, I had a question here. We're talking about when you when you get that bathroom sealed up, mm -hmm. when you see poop coming through. Depending upon the rest of the state of your house, after the plume passes, if whatever is in the air, it would concentrate in your house. Uh, and then if you come out of your sealed room and then to vent your house, then you're going to get contaminated in between. Is it better to seal a house you best can, or is it better to open your house up so things can flow through it and then and then stay in the right sealed portion? Outset. Yeah, and then, and then stay in the sealed portion, and that way, hopefully, it wouldn't concentrate in your house. So when you leave your sealed portion, you wouldn't get contaminated. Well, I think... If, if memory serves me correctly, and it, it's been more than a month since we took the class, <laughs> so that leaves me with a problem. Uh, but it seems to me like what he said was that the interior portion of your house, while it would get contaminated, it wouldn't be contaminated like it is outside because it's already kind of sealed off. So some would get in, but that's the reason for immediately going and opening the doors. So the party has to 
close up your house as best you can. Yes. So close the windows, don't leave your windows open, right. close it up, and then go into your sealed compartment. Right. You should have a because chemical release Where the plume down. might be coming through the air. Like it? a chemical, yeah, we yeah. mentioned having a, uh, a room, uh, usually the bathroom if it's large enough. Usually you require about 10 square, square feet of room per person, uh, per an hour or two hours, maybe three hours per error. And at that point, beyond that, you're not going to do so well. Okay. And especially, that's why it's valuable to have uh, some of these they gas masks. That you can get these yes. Other countries, they're real cheap now, like 20 bucks with the filters from all these different armies across the world, cheap. But, but keeping in mind that sometimes these uh, contaminants, the plume or whatever, will contain skin irritants. So even with the mask, you can breathe, but you don't want to get that stuff in your skin and absorbing it. Right. And that's why going in the room. Yeah, but when you have to come out because of right. no ventilation. Right. When you leave the room. Uh, the polypropylene stuff, can you get that at most like sporting goods stores? I'm sure you can at some. Uh, if not most, the question is, how much of it can you get? Uh, what I found was Seth and Edwards seemed to carry them very, they were, they're really on top of that particular thing. And I uh, have a real good supply of it. That's, that's where we picked up these and the glove liners and we've got some socks and whatnot. If you sealed up really, really tight, you can't stay in there too long. Nope. Exactly. Oxygen out. Right. And that's why they say it's 10 square feet per person for whatever. Yeah, and I forget. I read it, a certain manual, but I'll tell you, I was, I've was. i only had two months to prepare for this, so I started on it yesterday. <laughs> so uh, the, the issue there was, and then I had clients calling me all morning when I was supposed to be working on this. So I had to really rush through it. There's that. Does that Smith Neighbors also have the military headliners and the, and the... Yeah, they do. I'm sure that they have those. The helmet, the, bottom the, helmet the, the helmet liner. And it's Mickey Mouse boots. <laughs> yeah, they have those. They have those also. Yeah. 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 Why are yeah. those Mickey Mouse boots I knew Mr. Edwards personally. Did you? Did did you? Oh, cool. Do you have your, in your guidelines of, your, of going to seal your room off that you also turn off your heater and air conditioner? Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Maybe what I'll do... See, they presented that to us in a video. <coughs> and I think a couple of the links that I gave you here and that you will find on the uh, handout that I've got already scanned in and online uh, have links within those websites to the actual videos that we watched on some of them. And if you look around on some of the websites that are available out there, uh, you can find information specifically on this, and they show you how to set it up, what's in the kit, how you seal it off, and the whole bit. The uh, FEMA website has the, the CERT manual in it. Oh, it has a whole yes, manual? it does. Oh, you should That's go good. look at that. Then. I didn't realize that. I was going to say, it recommends that you hire greater plastic. Mm -hmm. and have a pre-cut. So all yes. you have to do is slam it up in a hurry and duct tape it in. And yeah, you don't want to be cutting up at that point in time. You should be able to find some sites if you just Google how to show me. And I did that. That's where I came up with those uh, links. So there's plenty of information out there. It's all a matter of how determined you are to, to really focus down. And I'd suggest you know, as these things interest you, to pick one topic and then delve into it and learn all you need to know about. If you try and, you know, scatter gun it all, all over the place, you're going to get way too much information all at once. And that gets hard to remember. Oh, I thought you were raising your hand. Oh, you were. <laughs> um, just as a backup on the water situation, I know at least two dozen freshwater springs within five miles up here to the east. You might have to hike a little ways to them, but yeah. if there is, there will be fresh water. I think you would still want to filter it, but at least yeah. it would be there. Yes, yes. 
Right. Better, right. better than digging a hole and getting drips. <laughs> yeah, we're we're um, really a very blessed. With we the, are. The, the, have you, have you put that on that one? Uh, a map that no, and he's not going to tell you what he was doing. <laughs> <laughs> but you might, it just means we'll show up at your house. Yeah. <laughs> You'll find out how many friends you really have. They live sad. In an emergency, we come to you and then you tell us. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can put them on a map sometimes. You, want. Yeah. you know, and we, we could put that up on the website even if we need to. Do a GIS, be like cat, you know, like geocaching. Make a game out of it. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Okay, if there are no other questions, then I'll turn the time over to you. On this, oh, there is. We've spent quite a bit of time on this plume, this plume or this mm -hmm. noxious gas or whatever. But isn't our biggest problem in knowing that it's coming rather than knowing that it's gone? I mean, if we have a radio, the, we'll probably pick that up on the radio. But, but you're likely to run into this. Because yes. you walk through the room and smell it rather than... Well, they actually, they, in the third course, what they told us was that in the eventuality of something like that, there's a real high probability that your local officials will come by and notify, get in your house, do your in-house sheltering now, they'll on a bullhorn or whatever. Is that uh, reverse 911, okay, and let people know, and then after it's over, and it's safe to out, then they'll also let you know as well. There's, uh, there's going to be a training on communications coming up, but uh, all of the wards each got a set of radios for each ward recently. How recently? Uh, I'm last prepared, week, emergency preparedness specialist in the woods. Oh me! Yeah, I just I got I heard Sunday. Oh, well, I've seen them at the stakes there. Yeah, they were there. Oh. So, but the biggest thing to to find out about that is uh, there's these little handheld ham radios that you will get in touch with the big ham radios that have access worldwide and stuff. But the big key is communication, and we're going to do a special meeting on that one. Yeah, and that's that will be a good one to attend, but just as a, a little disclaimer on that, to legally operate that little ham radio he's talking about requires a ham license. Mm -hmm. However, 